So, hey, Lou. I'm back. Yeah, that was a bit unfortunate, but um, yeah, Robin is already waiting behind the scenes. So let's bring him in. Hey, Hi guys. Good evening, Robin. Good evening. Hi, Robin. How are you tonight? Good, good. Looking forward to the weekend, but um, yeah. Overall. Yeah, aren't we all? Four days, right? Three days. Three days. Ah, three days. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, man, everything good. And uh, with, with you, you guys? Yeah, we're coping, I guess, right? Chugging along. No, no, we're having fun. Did you see the Did you see the first session of the evening by chance? Yeah, 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 yeah. I did. That one, I'm still processing that one, I think. And uh, and of course, the, the 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 second session was a bit of a uh, of an unlucky one, but still, there was some good stuff in there. So I'm still having fun. Uh, so, 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 what I wanted to ask you, Ruben, um, in your bio it says that since the age of twelve you've been into computers and IT and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, around what time did Microsoft spark your interest and Azure in particular? Oh, Azure in particular, I think f five years ago, something like that. So I started with uh, Office 365 and automatically uh, I um, stumbled upon Azure AD, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, from there, from there on, I just moved more towards Azure. And um, now I'm at the point I'm just doing Azure and no Office 365 anymore. So uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's also good news for you, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you're tonight. You're going to do a session um, called the Azure Bakery. Mm -hmm. uh, I think which is based on your blog series, right? Yeah, correct. Um, well, we are looking forward to your talk uh, where you can explain it in in real life. Um, will you also link to your blog series somewhere? Yeah, yeah at the end, uh, one of the last slides includes like a shortened URL, a tiny URL to, uh, to the blog series. And otherwise, uh, everyone uh, who already wants to start reading can just search for the Azure Bakery and then uh, yeah, no, you will find it. It's a catchy title. There's probably no one else <laughs> that has it. So, um, yeah, if you're ready, um, let's go. All right. Let me uh, figure this one out. Share my screen. So, do you guys? Okay. Yeah. Okay. This works. All right. Good. Then let me. Do this. Do you guys see my presentation? Yeah. Okay. That works. All right. We can see it. It's fine. Okay. Good. 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 Otherwise, <laughs> just start without without a without a slide deck. So, all right. Um, yeah. Welcome to the Azure Bakery. Uh, my name is Robin. Obviously, we just talked about that. Uh, I'm a principal cloud engineer at uh, at Linkit. Um, and um, yeah, I will share. Uh, well, uh, I'll share this slide deck uh, at the end on my own uh, on my own website, and there will be a link to the series, the blog series we just talked about at the end of this presentation. So uh, let's get started. So the Azure Bakery, uh, because of the available time today, uh, we're not going through everything in the series. Um, so I do recommend going through the series to further explore. Uh, and solidify the information in this session. Um, so um, yeah, that's an important point. There's way more information in uh, in the blog series, but it's just too much to, to put it in, what, 40, 45 minutes. So the idea behind this series uh, is to approach Azure in an easy uh, to understand and fun way. Um, and the goal uh, is to engineer and deploy solutions in the best way possible, uh, while at the same time, we're trying to keep it simple. So we'll go through the foundational layers of every solution you may want to build in the future and yeah, what ingredients do you need when you build these solutions. So let's start with the first layer, uh, Azure Active Directory. So when you sign up for a Microsoft Cloud service, such as Azure, the tenant, an Azure Active Directory instance is created. And this tenant represents your organization and is the first layer of our cake. Um, Azure AD is Microsoft's cloud-based uh, identity and access management service. Hit my space bar again, put my keyboard a little bit further away. Uh, and we'll go through um, identity and some security services. So let's start with identity. You know, to access and manage your Azure environment, 
um, you need an identity. Um, and yeah, this is essential for authentication and authorization. And authentication is the process of verifying who you are, whereas authorization determines what you cannot, uh, what you can and cannot do. So let me say that one more time. Authentication is the process of verifying who you are, uh, whereas authorization determines what you can and cannot do. And the, the first one I want to talk about is a user account. And yeah, obviously these enable users and administrators to log in um, and work with Azure. And when you authenticate, you need a username and a password, preferably followed by a second form of authentication called multi-factor uh, multi authentication. And we'll look at that later as well. The next one I want to highlight is service principles. And these are like user accounts, but then for applications and automation tools to access and work with resources within your Azure environment. And the authentication is handled by a combination uh, of the application identifier uh, and a secret key or certificate. And the last one is called managed identities, and these provide an identity for your resources. Um, and these identities can be used, for example, to access other resources, like the secret keys inside uh, an Azure Key Vault. We're going to look at this uh, in a later layer as well. And good thing to note of note here is, is that you don't have to manage your credentials. So if you use a managed identity, um, Azure manages the credentials for you. And when you talk about managed identities, there are like two types, and system assigned and user assigned managed identity. Uh, where the system assigned managed identity is created as part of a resource. So you, you can enable this or enable this during your deployment. And then this, this application or, or this resource has an identity within Azure Active Directory. Um, so you can use this for, uh, for example, a virtual machine. And a user assigned managed identity uh, is created as a standalone resource. And you associate that with one or more resources. And uh, yeah, for example, you use that for workloads that, that run on multiple resources, but share the same identity. So then you don't have to set up all these different identities for all your different resources if they all belong to the same workload. And we're gonna look at system uh, assigned managed identity at, uh, at the last layer, resources. So the next thing I wanna talk about is security. Um, there are yeah, a lot of different capabilities and offerings to enhance your security posture within Azure, like machine learning, conditional access policies, self-service, um, yeah, to name a few. Um, there's way more, but yeah, we cannot go into all these uh, right now. We're gonna go through multi-factor authentication and conditional access policies, because I believe that these are like foundational security features you always uh, want to or should be implementing. So let's start with multi-factor authentication. Right, this service adds a second form of authentication to the user's sign-in process. And uh, the user is prompted for an additional form of identification, such as approving the sign-in uh, or providing a code, finger, or face scan. And these requests are often handled through a second device, like, for example, your phone. And when you only use a password to authenticate, you leave an insecure attack vector, like uh, something you have versus something you know, or something you, you know versus something you have. So this is um, one of the essential features you always want to enable. There's even a report like 99% of, of all the breaches can be prevented if everybody just enables multi-factor authentication. So essential, uh, essential part. Next up, conditional access. Uh, so conditional access policies are evaluated when a user wants to access a resource or an, another form of identity want, want to access a resource. And with conditional access, you bring signals together. So you see that in the, in the image on the left side here, you see these signals here. Um, and based on these signals, you can make decisions uh, and allow or grant, uh, a grant or block uh, or allow or deny access to, to the, uh, yeah, the resources behind your policy. And Azure, uh, sorry, Azure, <laughs> conditional access policies um, use if-then-like statements. It's like in programming, if this, then that, 
uh, to keep your organization secure uh, and optimize the user experience. All right, that was the first layer um, of our cake. Um, Azure Active Directory, we went through uh, the identities, yeah, user accounts, service principles, and managed identities. We talked about system assigned versus user assigned managed identities that will become clear uh, in a later stage. And we talked about security, how sp uh, specifically multi-factor authentication and conditional access policies. Next up, management groups. Management groups are a crucial aspect for managing access, policy, and compliance across your Azure environment. So a management group is like a container for your subscriptions uh, and allows you to apply governance to all subscriptions within that specific management group. So most organizations have multiple subscriptions um, and management groups provide the possibility to organize subscriptions in subgroups. And these subscriptions inherit the configuration from the management group they're part of. So in this layer, we're going to look at enterprise scale landing zones, or also known as landing zones, uh, specifically managed groups and subscriptions. These are like the core of your landing zone um, architecture. And even though the, the landing zone framework is, has enterprise skill in it, um, it's, it's, and it's initially meant for enterprises, uh, it's also beneficial for every organization, in my opinion. So it allows you to design your management groups and your subscriptions and thereby your Azure environment in a modular and scalable way. So, and after landing zones, uh, we're going to look at Azure Resource Manager and specifically, uh, what is it? Like a consistent management layer, the scopes, within Azure Resource Manager and ARM or Azure Resource Manager templates. All right, landing zones. Um, landing zones represent a multi-subscription Azure environment. And it, it includes security, governance, networking, and identity um, by default. So they take all required resources into account uh, and make sure these are available when you're engineering and deploying your solutions. So a good analogy to a landing zone is a set of services required to build a city. So before you create buildings and people moving into them, um, certain essential services, you know, for, for example, power infrastructure or water and sewer sewage facilities should be available, right? Otherwise people don't have power, don't have water, uh, et cetera. So, and what you see here is like a landing zone subscription. This is one part of the, the landing zone framework. And um, it includes a few things by default, like uh, like IAM, identity and access management, certain policies. You have to think about management and monitoring. Um, what, what else? Security center, uh, network watcher, something you can include. Uh, you have to think about networking, like, hey, I'm going for a hub and spoke connectivity model or Am I going, going to deploy an express route or what I'm going to do with application gateways or API management gateway, all, all these uh, yeah, services. Um, and you have to think about shared services like Azure, uh, like Active Directory, for example. Am I going to deploy domain controllers and am I going to centralize the, the, these domain controllers so everybody um, that's, that's using Azure can use these centralized services, the centralized domain controllers, Azure Firewall, uh, all that stuff, because uh, everything you, you deploy, you have to pay for. So um, the more you can centralize and the more you can share, uh, the better. So what does it look like that the enterprise scale landing zone framework, right? At the heart of your um, landing zone environment, you have the organization of management groups and subscriptions. So that's, that's here. And the, the landing zone subscription we just looked at in the previous slide, that's this one. But there are also other things to consider. Okay, what I'm gonna do with management? Am I going to centralize my logging? Am I going to do something where, with a Seam solution, Azure Sentinel, for example? Or um, So it gives you like a framework uh, for, for brainstorming. Like, hey, what, what do I have to think about, right? The well-architected framework, cloud adoption framework, all these tools can help you uh, design yeah, a robust and scalable Azure environment that's secure by design, governed, etc. So, and at the heart of your enterprise scale landing zone, um, you have like management groups and subscriptions. 
And the first level um, in, in your organization is always the tenant rule group, someone here. And it's built in, so you cannot do anything with it. You can rename it, but that's not best practice. So just leave it like it is. Uh, and it allows you to apply governance um, at the directory level. And you can create different management groups beneath the tenant root group. You can go up to six levels deep. Uh, Microsoft advises like three to four levels to keep it like sim as simple as possible. But you can apply policies and configuration, role-based access control configuration on, on these management groups. And then they will automatically be inherited by the underlying management groups and underlying subscriptions. So you don't have to assign um, uh, all your stuff for every subscription, but you can assign it on the management group and then um, yeah, govern it that way. So next up, Azure Resource Manager. So this is the service for managing and deploying resources in your Azure environment. ARM enables you to manage your resources by using the available tools like the Azure Portal, Azure PowerShell, Azure CLI, or uh, yeah, REST clients to talk directly to the REST API endpoint, Graph API. And what you see here is that the same API handles all these different requests. So you have the same capabilities when you use these different tools, um, but get consistent results. So that's, that's like the power of Azure Resource Manager. When you look at Azure Resource Manager, you have four levels or scopes. So you have like your, your management groups, beneath your management groups, you have your subscriptions, beneath that one, your resources, and finally you have your, uh, sorry, beneath that one, your resource groups, and finally you have your resources. And um, like I mentioned before, the underlying levels inherit the settings or the configuration. So when you assign a policy on the subscription, here this one, then these resource groups will inherit uh, the, uh, the configuration and the resources beneath uh, beneath that or the, the that are part of these resource groups uh, inherit the, the configuration as well. And if you look at these layers, you'll see that these form uh, these are the same. Uh, I use in the cake uh, only upside down because when you bake a cake, you start at the bottom. Uh, but in the, yeah, this image, it's from uh, it starts at the top. And Azure Active Directory is missing here, but you get the picture. Next up, Azure Resource Manager templates. Um, they allow you to implement infrastructure as code for your solutions. And infrastructure as code has several benefits. Uh, so um, it lowers the potential for human errors. Um, you can create identical environments by using the same template multiple times. Um, and you can reduce costs by creating test environments on demand. So you need, you need a certain test environment. You just deploy that based on the same code you use in production. So if you like a, a, a consistent environment, right? And then uh, when you're done testing or you're done deploying that specific stage, um, then you just yeah, remove or destroy the environment. So and then at that point, you don't have any costs for your test environment anymore. ARM templates are written in JSON. That stands for J uh, JavaScript Object Notation. And this is a lightweight data inter-exchange format. And JSON is easy for humans to read and write. Not everybody agrees. Um, and easy for systems to parse and generate. Um, and you'll see JSON is, is being used in a lot of different tools and, and, and things, but uh, as well in ARM templates. And yeah, it's it's a steep learning curve, but eventually you'll get it and, and you'll, you will see or, or harness the power of these ARM templates. And again, working with ARM templates give you repeatable uh, repeatable results. So you're able to deploy the same resources in the same way. And they allow you to automate your resources deployment by integrating them with your favorite CI CD tooling. All right, another layer done. So we looked at management groups, um, enterprise scale landing zones, um, and Azure Resource Manager. Next up, subscriptions. So um, subscriptions in their simplest are like containers for your resource groups and eventually resources. Um, so when you deploy and use resources, the costs for the resources are built to your subscription. So the, your subscription is like the agreement with Microsoft and allows you to use their platform and their services. 
Subscriptions are mandatory when you want to deploy resources. So without subscriptions, you cannot deploy them. This is not possible. In this layer, um, we're gonna look at specific design strateg uh, strategies and cost management because um, every organization is different. So you have different design strategies and management groups and subscriptions like you already saw in, in landing zones uh, are flexible. So you can just yeah, create whatever you need or whatever you want. And there are many, yeah, multiple design strategies. So we're gonna look at three of them um, and yeah, cost management because Azure enables you to uh, build and deploy solutions that yeah, leverage the cloud's power, like you have basically unlimited resources um, you can use or you can leverage. Um, but eventually you're paying for the resources and services you use. So therefore it's crucial to manage your costs. All right, design strategies. The first one, workload separation. Um, I think this is the most straightforward approach. So you have like two management groups, uh, one for production and one for pre-production. Um, and both management groups uh, include multiple subscription, like A, B, C, and D, where ownership or responsibility uh, is the differentiator. Next is the application category strategy. Uh, this one builds on top of the workload separation approach by adding application categories under the production and pre-production management groups. The workload categories are different for every organization um, and are based on various topics like access controls, data protection needs, or compliance requirements. And because you have this, this flexibility and you can go up to six levels deep, you can also combine multiple strategies like the one you see here. So you have like a business unit that has multiple locations, maybe West Europe, North Europe, um, and then you'll see the whole um, approach we already looked at coming back, like production, pre-production, subscriptions, and then eventually your resource groups and beneath these resource groups, you have your resources. Next is cost management. Uh, we already talked a little bit about um, paying what you use, uh, pay as you go um, as well. And cost management starts with proper planning. So what services do you select? Um, what service tier or virtual machine size do you need? And you always start with collecting the requirements of your workload or your environment. And then you can use the Azure pricing calculator to um, estimate your applications or workload costs. So um, always start with planning, um, just like a road trip or uh, moving or whatever. And try to design your workloads as efficient as possible. So focus on consumption models uh, where you only pay for the number of transactions or runtime of the application, like uh, consuming uh, Azure functions, for example. Um, and use managed services when possible. So although the cost per unit for these managed, managed services is often higher, um, they have lower operational costs because you're not managing the underlying infrastructure. And after you deploy your solution, uh, you should regularly review your costs to optimize uh, your resources and your Azure spending. So Azure cost management um, shows you where your money is going and is integrated with Azure Advisor uh, that advises you on underutilized resources. Um, so before you start using uh, resources and start consuming um, uh, yeah, Azure resources and, and paying for it, I think it's a good practice to set up some uh, budgets, so budgets, spending quotas, and configure some alerts so that if somebody does something stupid um, somewhere, deploys a really ridiculous sized virtual machine without no, yeah, knowing what they're doing, then before you know it, you get an alert, alert and you can do something about it because you're not going, <laughs> you will not be the first one to, to spend like a year salary on, uh, on um, a misconfiguration within Azure. So um, really important. And setting up these budgets and quotas support organizational accountability. So are we staying with our, within our budgets? Is a specific department staying within their budgets, uh, et cetera? So. All right, 
So we looked at subscriptions, specifically at uh, design strategies and cost management. Next up, resource groups. So um, resource groups are containers, again, <laughs> for resources this time, and they give you a way to group them. So resources in a resource group share the same life cycle and can only exist in one resource group at a time. So you can move, add, or remove resources at any time. Some resources are easier to move than others, but um, it is possible. And when you create a resource group, you need to provide a location, uh, also known as a region. And because the resource group contains metadata about your resources, it's important that you specify the right location because this can be essential for compliancy reasons. And good thing to note, if you remove a resource group, you remove all the resources that are inside that group. So beware when you remove something. In this layer, we're, gonna, we're going to look specifically at regions. So a region is a set of data centers to ensure high availability. Um, and we're going to look at naming convention. So um, naming convention scopes, like naming scopes, certain resources has to be unique, for example. Um, and we're going to look at naming convention components. Now, it's really important to have a good um, and solid naming convention um, because um, yeah, you want to know which resources are which and uh, et cetera. So you want to want, want to be able to identify your resources. So that's really important. And um, you cannot rename your resources after you deploy them. So it's, it's really good to think, uh, think about that beforehand. All right, first thing we're going to look at is regions. So um, as you see here in this slide, uh, Azure is a global cloud service platform and it comprises um, basically out of two key components, the physical infrastructure, like the data centers, um, and the global network. So the physical infrastructure consists roughly about 160 data centers divided across 54 regions, and they're all connected to the Azure global network. Uh, maybe there are more regions right now. Uh, can be this one is already outdated. Um, and a region is a set of data centers uh, to ensure, uh, ensure high availability. So each region has a pair. Um, and this pair is another region, preferably located at least 300 miles or 482 kilometers apart, um, which is sometimes impossible. But most of the pairs are directly connected. So this is really important. Um, and it's recommended to utilize a regional pair uh, when you're replicating data uh, or building and deploying multi-regional workloads that um, uh, require uh, extreme high availability, or extreme availability. So, um, and for example, the regional pair for West Europe is North Europe. Most people in Europe know that, but um, so every region has a pair. East US, Central US, I think, or um, so. Uh, and all this information is available on, uh, on the in, inside the documentation. So naming scopes, um, certain resources are uh, by default available, uh, available um, through the internet and they are also accessible using a DNS name. So certain resources uh, have to have a global unique name. And sometimes this can be challenging because most of the obvious names, just like domain names are already taken. So you have to be a little bit creative there. And next one is resource group. So then the, the name should be unique within the resource group. And the last one is resource attribute. Uh, and then the resource attribute name should be uh, unique within the parent resource, like uh, mentioned here, a subnet within a virtual network. So you cannot deploy a subnet with, with the same name inside the same virtual network. When you look at a naming convention and you look at what Microsoft advises, um, then they start with this image here. So they start with a resource type and they end with an instance number. And there are recommended naming components, uh, abbreviations per resource type and limits to take into account. And uh, I will take you through these recommendations from left to right and my take on this. So if we look at resource type, uh, this abbreviation reprints, uh, represents the resource type and is used as a prefix uh, or suffix. So prefix is at the beginning, 
um, or suffix is at the end. Depends on your your organizational standards or what do you, what you prefer, and it has to do with sorting and all that stuff. And next up is the workload or the application. So the name or identifier of the um, of the application or workload that the resource belongs to, and try to keep this as short as possible. So uh, in this case, SharePoint. If you ask me, it's way too long. I would make SP or I would create a number that represents SharePoint or whatever. Next up is the deployment environment. So the stage of the development lifecycle. So also try to keep this as short as possible. Trying to use letters, uh, for example, P instead of production or D instead of dev. And then you'll end up with a region. Um, and just like we talked about before, um, this, is, this is the geographical location where your resource is deployed. And my take on this is only using it when you're utilizing multiple regions. So don't use this when you're only deploying resources within one region. And even then, maybe only for network resources. But there's not really one size fits all, right? There's, there's always choosing between different types of evil, so to say, you know? Um, so you have to... Um, yeah, make certain decisions and eventually you, you come up with something that, that works. And eventually, uh, or uh, lastly, you have your instance number. Um, and this is like a two or three digit number used to differentiate multiple instances of the same resource. So am I going to deploy numerous instances of this specific resource if I'm going to do that, or I think that's gonna happen in the future, then um, yeah, the advice is to use, use an instance number but this is not always necessary. So basically try to keep the name as simple and as compact as possible uh, while you have the information you need inside your naming convention. So we looked at regions, uh, sorry, resource groups, and specifically at regions uh, and uh, naming convention components and naming convention scopes. So the last layer, resources. So we're going to add resources on top uh, of all the previous layers. Uh, and with these resources, um, yeah, the, the cake really comes together. So we're going to look at the design recipe. So, hey, what, what is it we're going to add? Uh, what, what are these resources um, looking like? And eventually we're gonna bake them. So uh, that's the part I already did. Um, so I already deployed uh, the resources we're gonna take a look at inside my own Azure environment because I don't want to do the deployment while I'm presenting uh, for obvious reasons, so. All right. Um, the environment's design recipe is based on the enterprise scale landing zone architecture framework, like you can see here. And the management subscription contains a log analytics workspace for centralizing the logs, metrics, and audit data, you can see here. And the landing zone subscription, that's this one, includes the web application um, based on an app service app with an Azure SQL database as a backend. And the app service app uh, uses a system assigned managed identity, there he is, uh, to access and retrieve the Azure SQL service connection string from an Azure key vault. So during the deployment from, my, uh, from the SQL backend, um, I'll um, put the connection string inside the key vault. And during the same deployment, the app service app retrieves that connection string and um, configures it within the app service app. And the app service app includes two deployment slots, uh, a staging and a production uh, staging and a production deployment slot. Uh, and it allows you to swap your deployment into production and roll back if you want, for example. So. And I added four uh, Azure Monitor alert rules to monitor your web application. So let's um, switch to the resources. That's on this screen because this one is too wide. So uh, I'll be doing that here. So I won't be looking into, into the camera anymore. But um, what you'll see here uh, is I deployed two uh, resource groups. I got like two subscriptions a management subscription, like we just uh, looked at, and a landing zone subscription. 
And these are part of the management group structure I configured. So I got a landing zone management group here, with the corporation in here, and then the landing zone subscription itself. And if I look at the platform, I've got a platform management group uh, with a management management group. And inside, I got a inside that management group, management, whatever, uh, I got a management subscription. So uh, a lot of management, but this way we centralize the logging inside of this management group. So I got a centralized log analytics workspace configured here. Uh, this one has like a global, uh, global uh, naming scope. So this name has to be unique um, all across Azure. So that's why I put this identifier uh, in front of it. And uh, the application is deployed in the application resource group. And um, all these different resources are configured to log uh, log their uh, audit data, the metrics, and their logs to the log analytics workspace. And if we look at this application, you'll see the app service app, uh, sorry, the app service app plan, and then the app service app itself that's built on top of that plan or that uses uh, the, the, the infrastructure that's part of this app service plan. The staging slot, the production slot is as part of the uh, initial uh, application. And a key fault, SQL database, sorry, SQL server, and on top of that SQL server, you have a SQL database. So, and if we look at the app service app, uh, and we go to identity, now you'll see that um, this app has a system assigned identity enabled, has an object, object ID uh, inside Azure Active Directory. Every uh, object has an identifier, a unique ID. Uh, and this ID is used inside the key vault. So the key vault has an access policy that uses this ID that gives this application uh, um, permissions to retrieve the connection string from the key vault. So and if we we'll go to the configuration here, come on, all right. And we look at the connection strings. You'll see there's a default connection string that's based on a key vault reference has a type SQL server. And if we go to our key vault and we go to secrets, then you'll see that we uh, can see them because I've added my user as um, uh, to the access policy. Otherwise I couldn't see the secrets myself. So I can manage the key vault, but I cannot retrieve any secrets. I have to specifically give myself access to do that. Um, and you'll see the application here, the uh, app service app um, that has like get permissions for the secrets inside of this key vault. And if we look at secrets, um, then you'll see three, three secrets here, uh, the SQL connection string and the SQL admin username and SQL admin password that are um, um, yeah, generated during the deployment. And I'll do this on purpose. So this way uh, you always have your admin username and your admin password and nobody has to write them down anywhere. So they're part of this, this key vault and it's all, uh, all happens during the deployment. So, um, and if we go to the uh, app, for example, and we go to diagnostic settings uh, here, Now you'll see that um, uh, the diagnostic settings are being written to this log analytics workspace. And that goes for all the resources that, that are deployed here. And this whole deployment and design recipe and, and all the stuff we just talked about, you can, uh, can find that uh, here. I will share a link in the next slide or the slide after that to be precise. And this is the last layer resources where um, we'll go through um, the prerequisites you need, the, the resources we're, gonna, we're going to deploy, the design recipe itself, like this one, um, an explanation of what we're deploying, and eventually we're, go we're baking. So it's just like a tutorial included in here. It links to, uh, to, to my GitHub. Uh, I don't know if this opens in a new page. No, it doesn't. So everything you need is, is, is in here. So if you want to follow along or you want to do this yourself, um, yeah, you got everything you need uh, You need here. So, um, and that being said, let's switch back to my presentation. So what's the last layer? Resources. So we looked at the design recipe and uh, the actual baking. So, so um, 
adding the resources on top of all the underlying layers. So, and if you wanna want to um, yeah, take a look at the series, it consists out of six parts, an introduction plus five, um, this is the, the tiny URL that um, will get you to the to the series on Medium, IT Next, uh, part of part of Linkit, and yeah, that was my presentation. Robin, thanks a lot for all of this information. This was <laughs> quite a bit of <laughs> quite quite some information to process for me. <laughs> <laughs> but there were there were some small bits and pieces I, I had a little hook and I understood something of it. So I have a couple of questions about that. All right. Um, so uh, I think in the Azure Active Directory uh, layer, you talked about MFA and advising to just turn it on, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you advise on turning it on for everybody at all times or are there specific uh, situations where you'd want to step up your security? Depends. <laughs> it's an annoying answer, right? It depends, but um, I think you want to want to enable it at all times for your your privileged users, right? Combine it with privileged identity management. I talk about that in the series as well. Um, but at least your privileged users, users with more power, uh, you should always use MFA. Uh, and if you look at for your normal users, right? If you just leverage Azure, the, then you don't have the amount of users inside of Azure Active Directory you, you normally would have when you also use Office 365, right? Of Microsoft 365, I have to say, by the way. But um, so then, yeah, then my advice would be enable it for everyone. All right, you have to, to think about what are you using, basic authentication, exchange, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it takes planning, uh, but if you have the, the, the option to do that, then the advice will be definitely uh, yes, yeah. Okay, strong advice there. Um, yeah, so another one, if you look at the landing zones, mm -hmm. um, it goes down right all the way through through the resources, right? So the, the web app is also in there, the SQL database is in there. So where does the landing zone end and where do where does whatever lands on the landing zone start? Is as I see if I look at a landing zone, I'm thinking about some kind of base infrastructure that you put stuff into. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um well landing zones you can make it as crazy or as complex uh, as, as you want, right? Uh, and and my advice will be keep it as simple as possible. But but what you do, the landing zone, so the, the, the subscription where you actually land your application on, is just part of the whole landing zone framework, right? Because you also have like a management subscription that's not the landing zone for your application, but it's part of your whole framework uh, where you think about logging, for example. So um, you have to make certain decisions and and, certain decisions are binding like hey if I got a connectivity subscription uh, with a hub in there uh, where I centralize like a firewall and an express route or a gateway or, or whatever uh, and then I would deploy like landing zone subscriptions and and these landing zone subscriptions based on the requirements if they need like on-premise or hybrid connectivity or whatever then you can deploy a spoke in there as well and then they can leverage the hub so then you get this whole modular modular uh, design capabilities. Um, so you need need something else, just add it, add it, right? Um, so it, it's pretty, it, it's a lot of work to, to, to get it right, so to say, especially if you work in an enterprise and you got a lot of things to take into account, but uh, eventually if you do it the right way, you can always uh, deviate, so to say, during, uh, uh, during your deployments, like, hey, uh, oh, we didn't think about this, okay, how are we going to solve this, okay, I think we can do it like that, or maybe we have to create uh, another management group next to all the stuff we already have, because this is like an extra confidential zone or whatever, and has extra restrictive policies, or, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a lot to take in and a lot to digest, but I think that it's uh, the right approach to design your environment. Uh, even if you're not an enterprise, because because you see everybody struggling, like, hey, I got all these different capabilities, but what is the right way? And and there's not really one size fits all. So it's um, yeah, yeah. Well, what else to say, right? <laughs> so we'll just reference your articles then, and start from there. Yeah, and and the documentation from Microsoft is really really good. Right, they really did a good job with, with all the stuff they have, and then they're still building on top of that. So um, yeah, just just 
take some time, go to the cloud adoption framework, and automatically you will go to the well uh, well well architected framework, and then um, yeah, you definitely get some some value uh, out of this information. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for your session. It was really yeah, helpful thanks. for us. And I think next up, Jorrit is doing the raffle for the for yes. giveaway, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, so last month we had a uh, ref, uh, you know, referral link for the Azure Live event, and um, we actually got the names back from the organizers, the names that actually left their home address because uh, up for grabs is one VIP package for that event. And I think it's a physical package because they need to send it to your address. So yeah, I don't know what's in it, but it's a big surprise. And um, yeah, these are the names that are eligible. So um, I'm going to push the magic button and let's see who uh, who's going to win the VIP package. So good luck, everybody. Well, that's really close, but it's, <laughs> it turns out to be Robbie in the end. So Robbie, congratulations. We will, um, we will give your name to the um, Azure Life uh, event people and make sure that that uh, VIB package uh, finds its way to you. So uh, congrats. And um, yeah, this is the end of the show for tonight. So I hope to see everybody uh, again next month and uh, have a great evening. <laughs>